We are very lucky to have Professor John Leonard from MIT, uh, who will give a virtual grass seminar. Uh, we all wish he was here in person, but we will do with a virtual John. Uh, he'll be talking about challenges and opportunities in um, autonomous driving. Uh, John is a professor in the mechanical engineering department at MIT, and he is a member of uh, the computer science and artificial intelligence laboratory that many of us know uh, as CSIL. And uh, he has done spectacular work over the last 25 years or so uh, in the areas of visual slam, slam, autonomous driving, underwater robotics. Uh, to me, uh, as a student, uh, one of the biggest things that attracted me towards his work was a strong component of both perception and machine learning, uh, in addition to controls, which is what I was most familiar with at that time. And I've always enjoyed reading his papers, a very strong mix of both mathematics and practical applications. I will let John take it from here. Welcome, John. Thank you very much. That's very kind. Uh, really don't, uh, don't deserve that introduction. Um, so, uh, yeah, I kind of, um, I, uh, I last spoke at Penn in 2014, and so there might be a little bit of content here that folks have seen then, um, but, uh, you know, I, I just consider this more of a sort of a big picture overview talk, and a lot of it is how has my life changed or my thinking changed since I joined Toyota Research Institute, uh, January 1st, 2016, uh, and then sort of coming back with that sort of broader, um, perspective. So, um, I like to start my talks thinking about sort of autonomous driving in the news, and I like to ask people to raise their hands. Have you, have you seen any autonomous driving news articles lately? Um, which it seems you, you, you really almost can't go uh, a day or two anymore without autonomous driving news these days. Um, and so um, uh, this came out a couple of days ago in IEEE Spectrum. Surprise, 2020 is not the year for self-driving cars. Um, and so the industry resetting its expectations. I've been a bit of a critic of self-driving, at least in terms of the timeline, and that's some of what I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that and then try to update it though um, with my sort of current thinking and some insights. But um, the, uh, um, uh, if we think about predictions of self-driving, uh, one of the most bold prediction agents has been Elon Musk, who said that it would be possible to fall asleep and wake up at your destination using Tesla's full self-drive by the end of 2020. Uh, and if you go back in time, uh, the hype peaked um, sort of early in 2018. Uh, there's this quote by Wired uh, that they said, in the past five years, autonomous driving has gone from maybe possible to definitely possible to inevitable. So how did anyone ever think this wasn't inevitable? And I was the one raising my hand saying, wait a second, this is not inevitable. Um, and uh, the, uh, but um, if, and so sadly we had, there was the Uber fatality just after that article came out and the, and the field has had a bit of a reset, but on the more optimistic side, there still is tremendous progress. And so my Waymo is Google's self-driving car spinoff. And I'm just, uh, I'm an admirer of their sort of persistence. And uh, in December, they did some high profile, what they call empty driver seat rides. And they took uh, a, a driver from, um, um, uh, several publications to just do, you can record whatever you want, no one in the front seat, uh, uh, fully autonomous drive, and, uh, you know, there, there are rides of, you know, pretty impressive, you know, even though it's, it's Arizona, the weather's better, uh, and so forth, oh, there goes but, car. but, but, you know, it's, it's, it's impressive what has been achieved, and so, um, you know, I, I think, uh, the, you know, I, I would summarize it as mixed emotions is what I have still about self-driving, that I see the potential to save lives and I see the progress. Um, and I see a lot of exciting robotics technologies, mapping, localization, slam, perception, com coming to play, doing quite sophisticated behaviors. But I do think it's still gonna take quite a while. Uh, it's gonna be a long time. And uh, one thing that I saw um, back in, in December, this really kind of blew me away. Um, this is someone posted on Instagram, a uh, self-driving Waymo with no one in the front seat at the crosswalk of an elementary school. And, and I just, even now, I just can't believe that, that we're that far along and that you'd have self-driving cars with no humans on board uh, near crosswalks at schools. Um, and just one more sort of more positive, um, you know, admiration for the community's progress. Uh, Zooks just posted a video of a one hour fully autonomous drive in San Francisco with no disengagements. 
So, so the progress is happening. I think the, the challenge is how do, we, how do we get to some sort of very high level of robustness needed to, to fully deploy wide in widespread environments? And also, by the way, a business model that, that makes sense. So there's a lot of uncertainty and questions. Um, but as a roboticist, I want to try to give uh, some insights or just my thoughts on sort of where we are and some of the underlying challenges. And it's more of a sort of personal story. So I hope you don't mind if I go a little on the personal side in terms of this um, kind of talk. So I'm going to talk about my personal self-driving journey, um, which started at Penn. And, uh, um, and then history and challenges of autonomous driving. Uh, TRI's approach, which is to blend guardian and chauffeur, and I'll say what those are. And then um, a little bit at the end, hopefully, on some of TRI's kind of research roadmap. This is working with my, uh, Ryan Eustace is my boss at TRI. He's a professor at Michigan. I was his co-advisor at MIT, um, where he studied underwater vehicles. And I, and I would love to give another talk more about my MIT research group's work on semantic slam. And we'll just see how the time goes. Uh, maybe I can say a little bit about some of our most recent work. Um, which is heavily influenced by, say, Nikolai Atanasov's work at, at GRASP and, and other recent work out of, out of UPenn. So, um, so my background, I consider myself, I won the lottery in life, you know? Like, I, I am so fortunate. I, I grew up in Northeast Philadelphia. Anyone knows uh, Holmesburg? You're on I-95, you might know the landmark, the Holmesburg Prison. I, I, lived, uh, I lived there, I didn't, didn't go there, uh, thank God. And, uh, but, I study uh, autonomous underwater vehicles, self-driving cars, but the real core of my, my work has been the SLAM problem, mapping and localization. And so I uh, graduated UPenn in uh, 87, went to Oxford for my PhD, funded by Penn on a Tehran fellowship, I'm so grateful. And I um, couldn't find a job in 1991 when I graduated. I went up going to MIT to study underwater vehicles uh, and did that for five years and then got a faculty position in ocean engineering at MIT in 96. We merged with mechanical engineering around 2005, around the same time, well, a little earlier, I got to join the AI lab, which merged with LCS to make CSAIL. And I teach uh, um, in mechanical engineering, robotics, electronics, a lot of the things I was taught as an undergraduate at Penn. Um, and uh, I am very involved in service. I tend to be involved in faculty search every year. Please send your brightest graduates to apply to our faculty search. And um, I'm also trying to think about the tasks, the, the effect of automation on jobs and now the COVID crisis uh, with a bunch of economists at MIT. But I've had this wonderful opportunity to join TRI um, with Gil Pratt and Eric, uh, and, I, and I want to try to reflect on some of that. So this is sort of a joint TRI-MIT talk. I just want to be a little careful, but, um, you know, uh, uh, and so as, as all of you, I'm adjusting to the new life, you know, teaching via Zoom. Uh, you know, I've got a bunch of electronics gear in the bedroom of my house. Um, showing like live motor control demos with MOSFET H bridge, bridge uh, uh, connected to an oscilloscope and different things. Uh, also running a research group via Zoom. And so, you know, I've got about 10 students, uh, um, uh, postdoc, my former student, David Rosen, uh, he's, he's a, the math talk I'd love to give you would be David's work with Kevin. Uh, we just had a paper accepted, Tonio and Dihan at Wafer. Kevin has a paper accepted at ICRA. A bunch of newer students, a couple Navy officers. Um, I'm really blessed. My students are trying to figure out how to stay productive living in their dorms or in their apartments. Um, we're trying to think creatively about sending people robots and cameras and, and uh, uh, it's certainly um, you know, an interesting experience. We're trying to stay connected. And, um, but um, I'm just so sad that I'm not there in person with all of you. Uh, I truly love Philadelphia, I truly love Penn. Um, um, here's a little map. I love maps, navigation. This is where I grew up, um, Draper Street near uh, St. Jerome's uh, in, in the Northeast, and uh, went to Penn in 83, went to LaSalle for high school. Um, and uh, when I was an a, a elementary school first grader at St. Jerome's, I was a, a co-student with this guy, Paul McKenzie. We played street hockey together and uh, uh, lots of things. And Paul um, is one of our most famous graduates from the class of 87. He's, uh, now I think he's VP for manufacturing at J&J Pharmaceuticals, and he was just elected to the National Academy. And uh, you know, the kind of people that I met at Penn, they just helped me aspire to sort of greater heights. You know, my, so uh, Paul, Paul's roommate was Jerry, who was my lab partner in the Moore School. Jerry's now VP for navigation at Lockheed Martin, and uh, this was from our class reunion in 2012. 
and um, you know, Penn is always with me. You know, I, I just uh, the experience was just just incredible, um, and so I you know fond memories of the Hexagon Society. If anybody knows what that is, uh, and uh, I played something called lightweight football. I was probably the worst player on the team, um, but now it's called sprint football. If anyone knows who number fifty five is, you could uh, number fifty five is uh, Eric uh, Eric Ferda. Penn's Dean of Admissions. He was the center on the offensive line and I was one of the tackles um, when I could get on the field. And um, the, uh, my roommate Vico is a doctor in Westchester, New York, on the front lines of the COVID crisis. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, lots of folks here that I've, um, you know, fond memories from. And uh, anyway, so, 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 so that's a little bit of Penn nostalgia. So my personal self-driving journey um, I got to go to Oxford um, for my PhD, and this is me in the basement of something called the Jenkin Building, uh, the robotics lab at Oxford, and I'm using one of the first Sun workstations that they had uh, in, in England, and uh, if anyone knows what the box to the left of the computer monitor is, maybe Eric Krokov knows. Um, I wish I could, I don't know if I want to try to do the chat or not, um, but that's uh, something called the Data Cube, which was uh, roughly, I think, order of $80,000 box that could do frame grabbing and image capture and maybe canny edge detection or something like it at three hertz. But we were very impoverished in what we could do uh, at the time in terms of any sort of real-time computer vision perception. And so I, um, I worked on localization giving a map or building a map given localization. This is a screen recording of a live demo of having a small wheeled robot using ultrasonic sonars navigating around the basement of the lab um, at Oxford. The triangle is the dead reckon position, which quickly diverges from the estimated position. And the sort of dream of our work was to, to, to navigate as if the world contained beacons, you know, so that the objects in the world could be navigation landmarks. And that we posed this as a sort of geometric problem with uncertainty. And we wanted the robot to build the map itself and use that map to navigate and further to maintain the map when the environment changed. And so, um, and I was just very uh, blessed to have Hugh Dorant White, who was a GRASP lab alum, as my PhD advisor. Hugh had been a Tehran who came from England to Penn for 84 to 80, 83 to 86, although we didn't actually meet, meet at Penn. Um, and so Hugh uh, coined the phrase SLAM, simultaneous localization and map building, in a paper in 1995. It was first published. In my thesis, I called it simultaneous mapping and localization, which would be SMAL or SMALL as an acronym. And uh, Hugh realized that changing the order of the L and the M was a much better acronym for writing grant proposals. And Clue was, Hugh's advisor was Lou Paul, and he was closely mentored by Regina and Max Mintz. And uh, you know, the, the sort of active perception and pervasive, consistent representation of uncertainty those are sort of like part of the sort of the, 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 the kind of the dogma that underpins my research. Like I think that I'm very fortunate as sort of a, a grass, I consider myself a grass lab grandchild in the sense that through Hugh, uh, many of the sort of principles that Regina championed uh, and others, Max Lou, uh, kind of propagated to me. And, uh, you know, to me that I've always thought about the, and, and a sort of confession, uh, you know, at 54 years old, uh, I'm still working on a PhD thesis, you know, it's this dream of the robot that can navigate uh, robustly and accurately through the world. And despite all the tremendous progress on SLAM, I, I think if we really want to have driving cars and underwater robots and home healthcare robots, hospital robots that we can turn loose confidently, um, I think it's sort of improved understanding of the state of the world um, and, and, and what is where in the world is, is sort of we, we have more work to do. And I like to divide the slam problem in sort of different axes. Uh, one is representation. How do we represent the world? Do we use metrical or topological maps? Can we, do we use dense representations, TSDF, kind of octomap? Do we rep, can we represent the world in terms of objects? Can we develop semantics where we can understand the identity of objects? Can we do prediction, or, you know, dynamic models? Uh, and then talking to some neuroscientists, I'm very fortunate to be part of a new ONR Murray a neuroautonomy with BU with my Casimo trying to think about how do how do people navigate like what or mammals what happen grid cells place cells what sort of allocentric and egocentric representations in the brain the uh, um, 
And so once you choose a representation, then you have an inference problem. And so there's a sort of rapidly growing state estimation and data association problem, uh, and then feeds into learning. Uh, and then, um, but also we want to build systems and not just have a, a simulation model, but something that we can deploy uh, in, in the real world. And, and so that's sort of my career has been having different PhD students working in different places on this kind of uh, space. And I just feel really fortunate uh, for the students I have. Um, and so, um, so from a self-driving perspective, so this isn't necessarily a slam talk. And, and so I'd love to maybe in the future do a robust semantic slam talk. But maybe at the end, I can say a little bit. But if we focus more on driving and how slam kind of connects into driving with some of the driving challenges, um, for me, the sort of key event of my self-driving evolution was being the team leader uh, for the DARPA Urban Challenge, uh, working along with um, my late colleague, Seth Teller, who is a, a true uh, cherished friend, and Jonathan Howe, um, Emilio Fazzoli. Uh, we worked, um, we tried to create a vehicle that was more following its perception uh, rather than, than blindly following uh, GPS. And so I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with Dan Lee's heroic uh, efforts in the, in the DARPA challenge. Uh, for UPenn, who were the only, uh, I think, uh, non-Track A funded team to, to finish, uh, which was just truly an amazing achievement, uh, Penn and Lockheed. And so um, this was our DARPA Challenge team. And, and I look back at the faces in these photos uh, and the, the sort of, um, the venture capitalists in Silicon Valley consider these photos kind of like the oil paintings analogous to the American Revolution, I've been told, which is really kind of overstating it. But if, you're, if your picture's in one of these photos, you're, you've got good potential for uh, uh, raising, uh, raising venture capital funding. I'll say a little bit more of that in the middle. Not that that's the be all and end all. Um, but we, we, uh, we were one of the six finishers. We were pretty far behind uh, Stanford and Carnegie Mellon who finished uh, first. We attempted a, uh, a much more um, ambitious strategy. We used a rapidly exploring random tree ROT algorithm um, that Emilio Frizzoli and Saratesh Karaman adapted. Uh, with Jonathan Howe and uh, Yoshi Kawada to, uh, to, to try to use kinodynamic models in real time with a map that was fed by perceptual data. We had one of the first Velodyne laser scanners. This is driving up Mass Ave from MIT to Harvard. You get a million data points a second, and with our eyes we can see, you know, there's a bus, there's the road surface, um, buildings, trees, but in practice it's actually still pretty challenging to solve this data uh, in real time. And um, so when I look back, really as professors, our, our product is our students. And uh, if I look at the picture of the people we had, so Ed Olson is a professor at Michigan and founder of Maine Mobility. Sertes Karaman is professor at MIT, co-founder of Optimus Ride with Albert. Emilio co-founded Newtonomy with Carl Agnema, uh, and they, uh, which they sold to Delphi, which is now active. Uh, Luke Fletcher is with me now at, at Toyota. Um, Luke's uh, the boss of somebody named Steve McGill, who has uh, a Grass Lab alum. And uh, other folks, like the guy in shadow here, um, let me just try the fancier laser pointer. This guy, Yoshi, he's one of the engineers at SpaceX that landed the barge back on, the, the rockets back on the barge or on the ground for, for Elon Musk. And so um, it's really kind of amazing, you know, a place like Penn, MIT, CMU, the kind of, what people go on and do in the future is pretty, uh, pretty amazing. In fact, one of my current, uh, one of uh, my former students who did underwater vehicles as a master's student, Chris Cassidy, is now uh, the, the lone American on the International Space Station um, on, his, on his third trip into space. And so, um, so for all the students out there, you know, you have like just unknown heights that you can achieve in the future. So we had a very student-driven effort. So Ed, David, and Albert. They created a whole new messaging system called LCM, which is currently used by um, many of the self -driving, top self-driving efforts. Um, and uh, Albert now has this, his startup Optimus Ride with Sertash is doing low speed electric shuttle deployments in, 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 uh, in Brooklyn. Ed Ellison's main mobility company uh, is, is doing well with field deployments of low speed electric shuttles, kind of a different business model uh, for, for self-driving. So, um, so just briefly in terms of what's involved in, in making a self-driving car, on just kind of a bit of a look back, you know, I mentioned the RT motion planner, which, which is sort of operating on a local perceptual map we call the grid map, which is fed from perception data from LIDARs, cameras, radars, um, trying to come up with a local estimate of the vehicle state, the, the drivable um, uh, surface, and predictions for other agents in the world. 
And despite you know companies like Cruise, Zooks, uh, uh, Waymo with way amazing progress, there's still a lot of research challenges. How you connect perception to planning with uncertainty, incorporating prediction, uh, uh, very, very challenging problems remain um, for the future. And so um, our vehicle, just briefly, we had more sensors and computers than any other team. It required 3.5 kilowatts to fully power our blade, our blade cluster computer. We had a two kilowatt air conditioner on the roof to cool it and a six kilowatt RV genset uh, to power it. And uh, we, uh, um, you know, we, we were one of the six finishers along with uh, Penn, Cornell, uh, and uh, Carnegie Mellon came in first, Stanford second, Virginia Tech third. Uh, if, uh, if you'll forgive me with, uh, I've probably shown this too many times, but for anybody who hasn't seen it, uh, one of the memorable moments for us is the Cornell incident we had. Hopefully. Second vehicle to cross the line at the end of mission. Two behind Virginia Tech. This was about Virginia five Tech. hours into the six hour race. There we go, got a little issue. We're trying to pass uh, Cornell. Six Cornell. Looks like they're stopped. And, and it looks like they're, the, the 79 is trying to pass and has passed the chase vehicle for Skynet, the 26 vehicle. Wow. And now he's going to, and Talos is going to pass. Very aggressive. And Whoa. Oh, we had our first collision. Crash in turn one. Oh boy. That is, you know, that's a bold maneuver for uh, MIT. Okay, so apologies if you've seen that too many times before, but um, our, we actually, um, with a self-driving car, you can replay the data log and you can kind of see what happened with an incident like this. Now DARPA said we could continue the race, you could argue if we shouldn't have, um, but they said it was sort of a no fault situation. We were both kind of doing something stupid. Um, and even though the road was very wide and we could see a stationary car there, it turns out our code had um, some thresholds for classifying something as a dynamic object was actually very tricky. Even today, I would say for cruiser zooks in downtown San Francisco trying to decide should I pass a double park car or not, very, very tricky decisions. It turned out we had a few bugs in our code. They had a few bugs in their code. Uh, we traded our data logs and we wrote a, uh, a journal paper for JFR, um, the MIT Cornell collision and why it happened. This was a 38-page uh, peer review accident report. And uh, if you'd asked me then, um, how close are we to a fully, um, you know, cars driving on Star Drive in Boston or the Schuylkill Expressway in Philadelphia, I would say it might still be a very long time away. Um, but um, so that's kind of along with its kind of personal history. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about the history and how we get from the DARPA challenge to the present. Um, and, uh, and then talk about some of what we're doing at TRI. Um, so uh, back in 2010, uh, Google really surprised us all. So this was a Sunday New York Times article in October 2010. John Markoff broke the story that Google were driving publicly uh, autonomous vehicles on public roads. And uh, they had already, by this point, driven 140,000 miles. And, uh, we had known that Google had hired many of the top folks from Stanford and CNU, like Mike Montemurlo and Daniel Fairfield. Um, but um, it, it was amazing how, how quickly they actually, um, how much progress they made. And so these are, I think one day someone will write an Oscar winning movie about the early self-driving car project at Google. I mean, Sebastian Thrun, Chris Urmson, you know, just Anthony Lewandowski has quite an interesting story. Uh, and they managed to have this almost magical you know, core group of 12 people that were secretly doing something considered impossible um, to create, you know, a, a robust self-driving car capability. And they've received tremendous support from the Google founders um, who, 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 you know, they've invested billions and billions at this point. And the vision uh, is that, you know, the kind of the upside for self-driving uh, is pretty, pretty remarkable if it could happen. I was very fortunate back in 2014, back uh, at RSS in Berkeley, I got to ride in the Google Lexus prototype and I posted on Facebook, I felt like I was on the beach at Kitty Hawk. You know, the, the performance of the car was flawless. This is with me with one of my students, Ross Finman, who's who dropped out of the PhD to go off and get rich at a, at a virtual reality startup, um, sadly. But, um, you know, and the, the car did such a good job, I was really kind of amazed. Um, and um, the potential benefits of self-driving you have over 30,000 fatalities in the US each year. It's over a million worldwide. Um, safety alone is enough to kind of get me excited to get up in the morning and go, uh, go to work. 
But uh, beyond that, you can think about changing the way that goods and people move through the world, recovering the space of parking lots, recovering time lost due to commuting. The potential upside is pretty amazing. But there are a lot of challenges, technological uh, effect on jobs, employment, um, ethical questions, don't ask me the trolley problem, uh, which is really hard to, to think about. Um, uh, I like to think, Ryan Eustace and I sort of think about what some of the challenges are dealing with people, um, things like making left turns, uh, maintaining the maps, dealing with weather. And so just briefly, I want to, you know, talk about, um, I got involved. I, so back in 2013, I was more of a, someone on the sidelines who was saying, wait a second, this is really hard. You know, there are fundamental challenges about how do you represent the world and predict what might happen next. And um, at this point, I had never heard of something called Reddit, which is, there's a Reddit self-driving cars page, which is an amazing source of information. Um, and this one person said, I, you know, when, when I wrote, when I was quoted saying, I do not expect there to be taxis in Manhattan, no, no drivers in my lifetime. He said, talk about a Debbie Downer. He's not even 50 years old. And someone else said, sounds more like someone that's afraid of the technology and has trust issues with machines. So at this prompted me uh, in 2013 to put a dash cam on my car in Boston and start collecting data um, for challenging driving situations. And so to sort of defend my honor a bit, I want to show you some challenging situations that I think even today are still hard, although, although there has been progress. So just, um, you know, you're probably familiar with the different levels of automation. Part, level two automation, the driver has to be ready to take over at any moment. Um, level three, you need to give the driver sufficient time for handoff. Level three is really challenging. Um, uh, level four is when the human is now only a passenger and at least in either a geofenced area for level four, four or, or an unrestricted area for level five, that the car would operate with no human input at all. Um, so for me, uh, one of the big sort of challenges is how do you make left turns across traffic? So this is uh, gosh, six years ago now, but trying to make a left turn in a busy intersection in Newton where I live in Mass uh, with a very, on a very cold day with cars coming from the left with an occlusion, a mailbox, a tree, a telephone pole, cars coming from the right, there's no gaps, there's sort of backed up traffic. This is near uh, a high school, two middle schools, and two elementary schools within a half, within a half mile of this intersection. Um, and so the way that I turned was I waved at a driver, she waved back and kind of gave me um, a gap to turn into. Um, here's another one, this is in Brookline at Coolidge Corner, a police officer directing traffic. How do I know as a human driver to ignore the red light and respond to the police officer who's waving for me to go through the red light. Um, I think that that's a pretty challenging human robot interaction. Then at the next inter intersection at a green light, the police officer is going to raise his hand uh, and stop me at the green light. And uh, anything with like traffic cops, crossing guards. Um, and then of course there's dealing with looking into the sun. This is the same intersection at a different time of the year. There happens to be a police officer standing right here. Um, and dealing with difficult weather such as snow. And I think uh, one of the challenges with snow beyond like reducing your sensing range, increasing false alarms, is actually if you cover the road surface, you take away some of the secret of the kind of magic trick of how a self-driving car works. So it's been said, Arthur C. Clarke, that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And to me, um, this is never more true than with self-driving. The, the secret of the magician's trick of self-driving is that if you have a very highly accurate prior map, this is LiDAR uh, road surface reflectance map in Mountain View, California, courtesy Google, circa 2014, is that with a very accurate map, you can localize yourself down to a few centimeters accuracy. You can take away a lot of the uncertainty of prediction and understanding the world. Instead of having some ambiguity, is this car going to pull out or not? If you say, okay, that car is safely parked on the side of the road, and you can kind of define um, it makes it easier to sort of detect the unexpected when you know your position very accurately and you have a very strong prior map. So to summarize just uh, quickly, you know, maintaining those maps is a huge challenge. So the whole issue of dynamic slam, how, what happens when there's construction? Google can handle a limited amount of road construction, and for that I give them credit. But, but truly dealing with repaved road surfaces, roads covered with snow leaves, how do you maintain the maps? Dealing with adverse weather, interacting with people, and what we ultimately need for level four is truly robust computer vision with nearly perfect detection with no false alarms. Um, for level two and level three, we need to ask, can humans be trusted to take control when necessary? Um, 
Uh, I, with more time, I give you more examples from Tesla and other sorts of situations where um, you know accidents have happened. Sadly, you know, fa fatal accidents have happened where humans haven't um, been able to respond quickly in time enough when the system encounters a domain that it can't handle. For example, the Joshua Brown fatality in Florida. Um, Waymo, Google at the time, their self-driving car project, they did a trial with employees back in 2013, 2012, where they let employees drive the cars um, for days, weeks, months. Uh, the 140 employees were given the opportunity. No one else in the car, and they drove the cars fully autonomously. Uh, so they, 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 they were, it was meant to be a level two system where people had to monitor the system, um, and they said, please pay attention. Uh, in fact, Google have since said that people um, pulled out their computers and started doing emails, driving down 101, and in fact, someone fell asleep for 27 minutes going 60 miles an hour on 101. And that led Google to, to abandon level two and level three, said these humans are just too unreliable to take control uh, and to instead aim for a level four system. But with a level four system, then you really need to get this really, um, uh, you need to be at the perfection point on the ROC curve with near perfect detection with very low false alarms. So, um, so kind of my view of the state of the world circa 2015, 20, uh, is that it might take us uh, in level two and level three, like a Tesla autopilot type system or comma AI, you're always gonna need the human to pay attention and take control and humans aren't good at that. For a level four system, there's still, we still have a lot further to go with perception to get full autonomy, widespread locations. So um, I want to shift now and talk about TRI and its approach. And uh, so TRI was founded uh, in January 2016 um, uh, and with locations near Stanford in California, near uh, University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and near MIT in, in Cambridge. And uh, we, uh, I was very fortunate to be one of the first six employees of TRI, along with Eric Krokop, Gil Pratt, Russ Tedrake. Uh, and we've since grown to, uh, this number is a bit out of date, sorry, that's, uh, we're well over that number now. Uh, well, not too far over that number, I guess. Um, and um, we, uh, this is a picture from a uh, October uh, 2018 uh, offsite in our, in our Michigan driving garage. So you can see uh, famous Grasp Lab alum, Eric Krakow here, uh, Gil Pratt, um, Brian Eustis, uh, Larry Jackal um, from DARPA, Steve McGill is in here somewhere, and it's uh, we're doing not just we're not just driving. We're about sixty percent driving, thirty percent robotics, ten percent other, which includes advanced material discovery using machine learning. And uh, our approach at TRI um, is to uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say a little bit about what it takes to make a uh, sort of a commercial self-driving team. Uh, what are the components? And I talked before about how you know our DARPA Challenge team had order of fifteen to twenty students and postdocs that kind of work together to create a new system. When you want to try to do something more for ultimately for production or at a larger scale, there's just a lot more that goes, goes into it. So what's involved uh, in terms of an, a, a, an autonomous driving effort, even though this is a pretty big group of people and we're probably about double that size of that now, it's still, um, there's a lot of work to be done and I'd still say we're small uh, relative to peers. But um, our automated driving team, what's involved? So vehicle hardware, vehicle software, safety and system engineering, mapping and localization, perception and prediction, planning and control. We have this thing called driver risk assessment for the guardian application, which I'll say a bit more in a minute. The goal is to, uh, instead of having the human guard the AI system, as with Tesla Autopilot, we invert that. We want uh, an active safety system on steroids. We wanna have human driving, but with all the tools of robotic perception planning, um, uh, control, and helping the driver ready to sort of jump in and take over to prevent accidents. Um, there's sort of a uh, machine learning is a core technology, simulation is an underlying pillar. Uh, there's a whole um, cloud data effort in terms of capturing data from human driven cars as well as the robotic driven car experiments, uh, feeding that back through simulation and learning, thinking about the user interface, the user uh, experience, uh, and having a professional vehicle operations team. And so, um, so just a little bit of a sample of some of the, what our team, some, some selected team leads and members. Um, so Vehicle Hardware is led by Matt DiDonato. He's a DARPA Robotics Challenge vet uh, from WPI um, with the WPI Georgia Tech team. Uh, next to him, Chris Welch is one of my former ocean engineering undergrads at MIT and, and Bellin is a DARPA Challenge grad. Um, 
vehicle software, it's just that software workload is just uh, unbelievable. Um, safety is critical, having a separate safety and system engineering team. Um, we have some, uh, a strong team in SLAM. So Ryan Wolcott is a student of Ryan Eustace. So Ryan's my grand student working on how you could automatically capture and harvest visual maps and, and LiDAR maps uh, um, at, at scale. Um, doing perception, so doing uh, semantic segmentation, object classification. Um, a lot of that technology is becoming commoditized at a certain level, but prediction is still very difficult. Um, planning control, um, uh, I mentioned driver risk assessment. Luke uh, is, our, uh, is an, actually Alex Zelensky's student at, in Australia at Canberra, who was part of our DARPA challenge team and then came back for this. Adrian is uh, publishing CVPR papers, leading our, our machine learning effort for things like physical object detection. Uh, simulation cloud UX, and we have actually a pretty amazing vehicle operations team. One of the one of the one of the things I've re really learned, you know, led by Sharon, is that the uh, safety drivers for companies like Google they have a tremendous job in in deploying the system, and actually giving feedback to the to the software developers in terms of how the system performs. And so we're you know it's it's almost, I almost think there could be like a joke like how many people does it how many people does it take to drive a self driving car. And not just the safety drivers, there's sort of an army of people behind the scenes, uh, processing data, reviewing logs. Uh, it, it, it's, it's sort of an amazing uh, amount of work. And, and so, um, so what we're trying to do at TRI is we want to have one system that has these two operating modes. So Chauffeur is, is what we refer to as the name, code name for the Google uh, original car project, the vehicle that drives itself for what we call mobility as a service or MOS. And in Chauffeur, the vehicle is fully autonomous, engaged uh, at all times. Um, and uh, our best projection is that uh, Chauffeur for mobility as a service will be deployed in limited areas, uh, perhaps with shared mobility fleets kind of slowly expanding over time. You can see that with Zoots in San Francisco and Cruise or Waymo in, uh, in Arizona. Um, but what makes Toyota unique, we're also doing this thing we call Guardian. And here, the driver always stays engaged but the vehicle monitors and intervenes to prevent collisions. And our, and our hypothesis is that a lot of the core technologies for um, perception planning, prediction, maps, that they are actually underlie the, both the Guardian and the Chauffeur application. And so, um, so the, the, the real thing we're trying to do is one autonomy stack that is flexible and expandable to uh, kind of future needs, uh, for example, with on-the-fly mapping, but also applicable both to safety and full self-driving. So um, Gil articulated this approach even before TRI was founded. There was an interview back in September uh, 2015 in IEEE Spectrum where he talked about how <clears throat> we can deploy the technology sooner by having the AI system guard the human and also enhancing the joy of driving. If, if um, sometimes I've been asked, you know, like what's it like to drive in a fully automated self-driving car? it actually gets a little boring sometimes in the sense of you're kind of like a FedEx package sitting in the back, you know? Um, I love driving, even, even in Boston traffic, you know, I, I think that we want to somehow get the joy of driving and the human agency in terms of being in control, but supplement that um, with, with improved safety. So I'm going to give you some historical highlights and I apologize for going fast. Um, we've, we built a sequence of prototype vehicles um, we're up to our platform four and platform five vehicles. These are platform two vehicles. So these are Lexus LS8, uh, uh, Lexus uh, LS600H uh, vehicles. This was in a closed course track in Texas in September 2017. And let me see who I can identify here. Uh, let me just, uh, this is Steve McGill, Grasp Lab alum, and uh, Ryan. Uh, I don't see any, I don't see Eric in there, but uh, let's see. Um, and um, so I've been doing self-driving quite a while now, and I have um, uh, the um, I have pictures of my my 13-year-old son in a baby stroller when he was one next to the DARPA Challenge vehicle back in 2007. And I recall um, bringing him to TRI in in order 2017 and said, "Hey, do you want to see our self-driving car?" And he said, "Dad, you've seen one self-driving car. You've seen them all." Um, which maybe hurt my feelings a bit. But what's different about our self-driving cars, at least some of them, is that we created a dual steering car with two independent control um, uh, cockpits. And so we have the left hand uh, conventional drive, um, 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 hardware connected drive. We have sort of an automation system you can think of in the middle and then a human 
uh, drive-by wire um, for a passenger in the right-hand seat. And the reason we did this is we want to be able to test the guardian in challenging situations while still having a safety driver that can take control. We're rather safety obsessed and we tend to have safety drivers that just take over um, really at the slightest. We're, we're not trying to push the limits in terms of, of um, um, disengagements or anything. We're trying, to, we're trying to like really innovate and develop the system with safety in mind. And so what I'm gonna do is send you a, sh a short video clip, what you're gonna, and actually, uh, uh, so you're gonna hear Gil uh, narrating, Gil Pratt, and uh, it's gonna, um, uh, uh, what you're gonna see is this driving with the dual steering, Ryan Eustace will be in control of the car in the right-hand side, and then we'll show the Guardian take over when we ask him to fall asleep. So uh, I'll let Gil do the talking. Now we're gonna demonstrate our Guardian system. We're going to emulate what happens when a driver falls asleep. Guardian can tell I'm using a camera that's part of the dashboard. The camera can even see through sunglasses in order to see what the driver's eyes are doing or if their head is moving into a position that indicates they're not paying attention. So Ryan, whenever you're ready, why don't you go ahead and pretend to fall asleep. Now Guardian has stepped in. It's driving the car for you. And now it will offer at some point to give it back to you. Why don't you go ahead and take it now. One of the most frightening things that can happen on the highway is when a car in front of you switches lanes to avoid debris. You have very little time to react because your view is blocked by the car in front of you. We have sensors that can see significantly better than a human driver can see. The Guardian is going to take over where a car switches lanes in front of us in order to avoid debris. Here that car switches lanes, Guardian decides we have to switch lanes also and we avoid having a crash. Now Guardian has offered to hand back control, and Ryan has taken control back of the car. So today you've seen demonstrations of two basic technologies that the Toyota Research Institute is doing research on. This is all part of PRI's work to eventually build a car that can never be responsible for a crash, regardless of what the driver does. So that's a bit older now, but it sort of shows the concept of something we're working on. Oops. So, oops. Okay. So um, I'd love to show you some more recent stuff. We're actually a little bit shy in terms of not doing too much in the press. Um, if you know where to look, we've um, we've uh, got some video in Japan. This is actually with a, 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 rare, a very famous Japanese actor who came to visit us, um, and uh, uh, there's this is all on YouTube, so it's public. But I'm not sure. Uh, if I have the time to show just a little snippet, um, the, uh, um, the uh, uh, what the heck? So, so Alphon, I want to show you some of our test cars. Here we go. So this is one of our Platform 3 Guardian test vehicles. This car has three types of eyes, LiDAR, radar, and cameras. This car's brain is actually in the back of the car. What's the deal they saw that? This is where the car thinks and reasons about its world. Wanna go for a ride with these? So if you're ready, yes. we'll have you get in the car. Okay. Look look. <laughs> We're gonna take you on a ride and teach you about the AI technology. So we'll show you the perception and the prediction and the planning that goes with it. This is the raw data that comes back from the LIDARs that are on the roof of this car. So here you can see, these are the eight uh, different cameras that we have mounted on the roof. Unlike a human, our vehicle can actually see 360 degrees around it at all times. Now one of the next things that our, our AI system needs to be able to do is to predict. So, so, so oh, sorry. I, want Oops, I should have let that play a little longer, but I think for the interest of time, um, the, um, let's see, uh, I, I wish it was a live audience and I could ask about questions, but let me, um, so where, where we're at with that project, with our, with our main driving effort is that we're, we're, um, uh, let's see, so, to show. let's see, we're, um, we've been working towards autonomous driving demonstrations at the 2020 Olympics in Japan. And so, uh, you know, sadly the Olympics has been postponed and that's sort of thrown a wrench into our plans. But uh, what, we're, what we're doing is we're sort of uh, continuing to, to strive forward with um, this sort of core autonomy stack that applies to both, um, both the Guardian application with the human aided and, and the full chauffeur application. Um, and sort of watch this space. I hope we'll have more to show soon. Uh, it's just our 
out, our sort of rollout has been a li little delayed by the uncertainties with travel and the Olympics. Um, but we are a research institute, and I do want to talk a little bit um, with my, my remaining time about our kind of driving roadmap. So unlike some of the other startups like Zooks and Cruise, um, we, we have a, um, a very core mission to generate um, papers uh, and to fund university research. So I think many of you are probably aware we, we had the university, what we call 1.0 program, run by Eric Krokov um, as our chief science officer that is now rolling into university 2.0. Um, we're expanding our network of universities that we're working with. Um, and uh, in our internal efforts, we've had this uh, uh, dream we call radical, robust autonomous driving, incorporating cameras and learning. And we're sort of trying to pursue a research agenda that um, tries to think about how do we, Toyota sells uh, 10 million vehicles a year. Uh, Toyota vehicles last about 10 years on the road on average. You can add it up, it's sort of a trillion miles of driving data a year. How do we, uh, to achieve the benefits of safety and improve mobility for all, we need to have algorithms that can scale, um, thinking about scalable approaches um, and also scale to using less expensive sensors, more use of vision, um, so we're working on uh, scalable slams that are harvested from vehicle fleets, onboard perception, machine learning, the whole driver state estimation, knowing if a human is paying attention, um, how do you intervene safely to um, don't hit things, stay on the road, don't get hit by other uh, vehicles and do that in a safe way. And a lot of it comes down to predicting the intent of our own driver and the intent of other drivers. And so I'm gonna show you just a few little uh, examples. So one of the big uh, things is, most self-driving efforts are related on, relate, um, rely on very high definition maps that are used for localization, lane level navigation, and connect to the planning step. What we're trying to do is to go from a, um, a high definition map mindset towards more perception driven, kind of this really matches some of the goals we had for our DARPA challenge. Can we go, um, can we have like some sort of, some functionality everywhere based on lower resolution map uh, inputs? and try to aspire towards live mapping over time. Um, and so we have efforts, and in, in, this is a little bit older now, but basically harvesting map data automatically from vision data. This is led by Ryan Wolcott in our Michigan office. Um, let's see, um, improved perception, we can always use it. Um, and we, uh, we have a real commitment to publishing at, at, at top conferences. And so I think Adrian uh, Gaydon's group has uh, He's involved in six papers at CVPR this year in 2020, which is, which is really uh, remarkable, I think, for the size of our team uh, and techniques for doing um, object pose estimation from monocular vision. Uh, another effort is in super death. So this is my former student, Sudi Pillai, um, paper from April last year in Montreal. He, he's with us in our California office in our machine learning team and trying to do um, depth prediction from, uh, from monocular images. Um, we're working on uh, segmentation, like many other efforts, uh, and uh, driver gaze estimation. So Simon Stent at, at TRI uh, is, is a, a Cambridge University grad. He's, he's working on um, the problem of how do you connect into to, to gaze estimation. Um, there's an effort, collaboration with MIT, um, of uh, basically just taking from any video, trying to do predictions of, uh, of human gaze, and then ultimately connecting this to human intent. So this is a little bit older. Um, kind of uh, example from one of their papers. Um, and uh, okay, and so um, with the um, driver risk assessment team with uh, Steve McGill, Guy Roseman that I'm involved with, we're, we're working on um, prediction. And so we're trying to harvest data from human driving to do predictions uh, with uncertainty of, uh, on, on roads. So this is a paper we had at ICRA last year. Um, and I think on time, I should try to conclude and then maybe answer some questions if we can do it over the chat. Um, the, uh, so in the very short term, I remain a contrarian. I think, um, and obviously the COVID crisis is gonna be tough on some of the startups, I think. And in general, um, I think mobility is gonna be transformed. In my, in my role on the task force of work of the future at MIT, I'm, I'm trying to struggle with what's gonna happen to public transit. You know, I think, um, sadly, I could see an increase in human um, uh, private vehicles, you know, um, and, and public transit is gonna hurt, which is gonna hurt the ability for people um, to get to jobs, especially lower income people. And I think traffic on the Schuylkill Expressway when this all comes back is gonna be even worse um, for all of you. Um, I think uh, the expected timelines for widespread deployment that people talked about five years ago were unrealistic. Um, 
Um, I think the key question is where will they be ready, not when. I think we'll see the limited rollout of mobility as a service systems uh, in, um, in, in limited domains, better weather situations. Um, um, and so incremented, incremental deployment is already here. Just look at what Waymo is doing in Arizona. I think infrastructure can make a huge difference. And I feel as a society, we're kind of missing the chance to make smarter, safer cities. Um, I think we should invest in vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure sort of communications to help, you know, sadly pedestrian fatalities in big cities like Boston, New York, Philadelphia are on the rise. Um, how do we make it safer for cyclists, pedestrians? Um, I do think there's a wonderful research agenda to be investigated for my own MIT group, which I, I wanna try to give another talk sometime, the whole issue of semantic slam and understanding the world in terms of objects to facilitate prediction and robustness. Um, and how do you couple perception to planning, achieving high integrity? And then a whole other dimension, you know, we have, I'd love to hire more faculty in this area at MIT. How do we achieve this sort of social ballet of driving and human and robot interaction that I think is, uh, has been elusive. But I am an optimist um, for highly automated driving in a more of a 10 to 20 year time frame, I think that the safety motivations are huge. And I think that um, there still is technical progress being made. Uh, and I think we can make cars safer. And, and so that's my, my dream. So um, to try to wrap things up here, um, I would try to ask this if, if we were a live audience, but um, uh, does anyone know Amara's law, um, which is that um, we tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run and underestimate in the long run. So Rory Amaro was a Silicon Valley technologist. This is a quote that Rodney Brooks uses and I've kind of stolen. Um, I think that is the case with self-driving. I think that we've overestimated what would happen in sort of this five-year time frame. Um, but I, I think that over time that there, there still is this tremendous potential and, and I think safety will provide the first benefits. That's why I'm so passionate about the Guardian application uh, at TRI where our dream really is to make a car that's incapable of causing a crash using all the best robotics algorithms uh, that we can put together. So I think I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you so much for your talk, John. Uh, please, um, the audience, if you have questions, uh, maybe you want to unmute yourselves and talk. Hey, uh, John Kingsley, Fragana here. I can see how you would want to predict the intent of your driver. What's a bit unclear to me is how you do the same prediction for other drivers just by looking at the sensor information without really getting to know what's going on inside the cars. Right. Well, um, for example, in some of the challenging streets in Cambridge, Massachusetts, near where our offices are, sort of Hampshire Street, and and uh, um, they, uh, if we use the fact that we have maps and we know how drivers tend to behave historically, so imagine if there's, um, um, for example, a place where um, you might, um, uh, that, that in the past you've observed drivers making kind of hard right turns off of a road, you know, it, it, our hypothesis is that it can kind of emerge that what we want is a probability distribution. So we want to be able to know that there's a probability that cars tend to make this, this turn or just, um, to me, it goes back to this almost magical question because I asked Guy Roseman and, and Stephen Gill who are kind of leading this, like, you know, uh, it, it sometimes defies the fact that the predictions are so good, it almost like makes me scratch my head, like how did, how did it actually do that? Um, or another example, um, there's, a, there's a startup um, out of Harvard called Perceptive Automata. They um, have a really cool technology for trying to predict will pedestrians cross the road or not. And so they've, uh, um, they're a startup, and disclosure, T T Toyota's AI Ventures is one of their funders, but they, um, um, they use a cognitive science model to sort of try to understand uh, a person's likelihood to kind of step in the road. Maybe they're looking at their phone and they can outperform a pure sort of black box data-driven model by using sort of these sort of cognitive model insights of human prediction. Thank you. Dan? Hey, John. Uh, first, thank you for the great talk. Uh, thank you for your great work. And thank you for the tremendous service to the society that you've been providing by um, 
sober uh, reflections on technology. Uh, we're all grateful to you for many, many uh, years now. Um, I have a um, I have a specific question. I was uh, I was uh, well, many things that you said were very exciting and interesting. I I wonder what when you think about hiring. So HRI seems to be a really fundamentally important and difficult area. And it seems very, very difficult to get any academic purchase on this. Some people have done it very, very well but in academia, but it's, I think it's very hard to do. When you're thinking about hiring faculty or raising students in this area, particularly with this question that we just heard, you know, those kind of questions, um, are we going to merge with the psychology department? Are we going to become biologists or what? Are we uh, animal ethologists eventually in robotics? What are you thinking? What are you guys thinking about when you imagine pushing research in these directions? That's a really uh, challenging question. I mean, I, I'll, I have to say that it troubles me because I see the societal need and I am deeply involved. Like this year, I chaired our faculty search in Mekki with 308 applicants for one position. You know, and utterly painful decisions about who to invite and, and so forth. And um, I see my colleagues, for example, in Aerostro Engineering, they've made this human uh, robot interaction, a, the human machine interaction, a huge requirement for them. Um, if you, one of the challenges is that when I think about my many MIT colleagues who like to think about like writing down the equations of motion and developing a, a controller based on the model, um, you know, they, they uh, when they look at the more qualitative results, like your, your key outcomes might be surveys of users, um, there's a sort of impedance mismatch between the academics uh, and the traditional engineering disciplines and what folks that are trying to innovate in this space are doing. And so I think we need to think uh, out of the box in terms of how we do the evaluations. Uh, and it, it's sort of like, I, I just sort of share your question that I'm, I'm puzzled. Like, I think we need to take more risks uh, and hire folks that are a little bit more on this qualitative side, or we need to sort of find a way to bring in the engineering science uh, to study the human I don't know how um, so automate human, uh, instrument humans, or you know, uh, like create highly instrumented cars, for example, that might drive and whatnot. So I'm sorry, I'm probably punting on your question, but I share your I share your question, and I don't necessarily know the answer, but I do think we need to take some risks. Uh, hey, John, this is uh, CJ. Thanks again for your for your wonderful talk. Um, among the many th th interesting things that you said, you you're pointing to sort of the uh, uh, potential of sort of V2V and V2I. And again, this is something that I guess we've all been hearing about. And uh, um, I'm just curious to hear sort of your perspective on why, on what you, what you think this will sort of really, um, where do you think that it's, it's, it's uh, going to be sort of most impactful? Well, here's the challenge is that, and I don't mean to criticize the government, but um, the, the efforts that I think about, like the, the, say the big three US auto companies funded by the US government on projects like the CAMP project, there's been these very kind of slow incremental snail's pace rollout of, you know, sort of instrumented intersections. And it's all kind of well-meaning and it's, um, and there, there's strong um, researchers involved, but um, somehow I think we need, we need a more Silicon Valley entrepreneurial kind of approach that you would somehow have a self-financing model to just get lots and lots of devices um, out there. Um, because I think that, I don't know if you're familiar with Dave Mendel, my MIT colleague who's co-chairing the task on, for some work of the future. He, he has a startup called Humatics, and one of their technologies is, is Wi-Fi, uh, wireless ranging. Uh, and they have a, um, I mean, if we think about safety, I mean, I could quote Missy Cummings who says, you know, you know, by the way, you could say like, well, where are the flying cars, you know? And you think about all this kind of hierarchy of challenges. Um, why can't we make trains and subways safer? And it may be that, you know, um, so I think by using, uh, to, maybe we can use technology, situations like, uh, I know Dave Mendel's um, company, they, they think about like subway automation and improve safety. So, so I, I think that, I think there can be a payoff if you have high integrity ranging information between uh, um, machines and infrastructure or people and infrastructure. Um, but I just worry about how do you pay for that system? How do you maintain it? How do you sort of make it kind of self-sustaining? Um, I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but I, I think there's opportunities there. Are there any more questions? 
Um, hey, uh, Professor Leonard, uh, this is Sherry. Um, thank you so much for, for the talk. This is great. Um, I just have a quick question about one of the last points that you mentioned. Um, you mentioned that interaction with humans is um, an important goal for self-driving cars. Um, and you also mentioned that there are a lot of work at TRI on prediction of um, intentions of other road agents. Uh, but because like, I'm also working on the thesis in this topic, um, but um, there seems to be a gap between the prediction and planning um, in the interaction sense. Um, do you have any suggestions on potential um, research directions on the planning side to try to, you know, like actually like let the cars interact with people? Right. Well, I think um, that's a great question. I think that's a great opportunity in a thesis investigation. I'll, um, if you send me an email, jleonard at mit.edu, edu, I'll send you a pointer to maybe some of Guy Roseman's papers. He's a kind of a research scientist at TRI, former CCL postdoc. And um, uh, we're trying to think about some of these issues. Uh, in, our, in our driving stack, the, um, you know, we have to make this connection from predictions to actual planning and control. Um, and in, in terms of, let me think in terms of published work, you know, I think maybe Saratash Karaman at MIT um, might have something in this area, or I'll, I'll, I'll send you guys papers and I can follow up by email. Um, but it's, it's a great area to be working in. I think prediction is the, is the problem of the next decade to me. That sounds great, thank you. Michael has a question. Hi, John, thanks for the, the great talk. Um, given you know, the focus you guys have at TRI on safety, um, what do you think the role is of, of the sort of more formal methods-based uh, quote-unquote guarantees for safety that you might try to achieve in such a difficult setting as autonomous driving? Right. Um, well, I've been a fan of, uh, you know, the, from a distance of, you know, like, um, for example, Hadass um, at Cornell's work, and we hired John DeCastro at TRI. Um, I, I think that, um, I think formal methods, um, I, I, I see formal methods playing into uh, some of these problems. I, I haven't fully got my head around how it works with uncertainty. And so how do you avoid more conservative worst case bounds of uncertainty um, such that you're kind of paralyzed with thinking about the worst case all the time, you can't kind of move forward. Um, I know I, I probably almost want to pump that to Russ Tedrick if he were here, because I know he's thinking deeply about that um, with some of the people that he um, interacts with both at TRI uh, and MIT. I think that, um, I'll make a plug for Luca Carlone and David Rosen's work in terms of not necessarily formal methods um, in that tradition, but more of uh, thinking about certifiable perception. So with, uh, we have an algorithm called SC Sync of trying to create, say, a SPLAN algorithm that under certain assumptions can certify its answer. And so imagine if you could have a certified perception system that you could basically um, kind of self-ascertain uh, with almost some magical tricks and in, in convex and in, in duality and optimization to then couple that to a formal methods algorithm to try to then be able to um, really be certain that the upcoming sort of time horizon, that there, there is a safe, feasible trajectory given the perceptual inputs. So uh, thank you, John, for uh, such a nice chat and the talk. Uh, if there are no more questions, uh, let's thank uh, John again. And uh, uh, we, oh, there is one from Hemang Purohit. Do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah. Okay, so I guess uh, uh, he's not online. Okay. Uh, th thank you for joining us uh, and uh, stay safe and have fun in Boston. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And uh, you're all welcome to visit us uh, at MIT. I will close the meeting now.